one of me. After eight years, what did they leave us with? They left us with declining agriculture, declining industry, interest rates were high, inflation was high. In fact, if you look at the data in terms of macroeconomic performance in any economy, since the year 2000, the tenure of the former president was the worst in, in, in terms of outcome. He advised officials who are politicking to desist from it. My humble advice to former President Mahama is to take a look at the data. This is not green book data. This is the data. Right? Take a look at the data before you speak. Otherwise, you'll end up embarrassing yourself. He was confident on government determination to maintain a strong economic stability. There is no government in the history of the Fourth Republic, the first term government in the history of the Fourth Republic, that has provided as much infrastructure across all the sectors, whether you're talking about roads, you're talking about water, you're talking about t toilets, you're talking about education, you're talking about health. Right, uh, we're getting on to the telephone. I appreciate surely to speak with spokesperson of the former president, John Dramani Mahama, Felix Ofo Squatchi, who is a former deputy minister of information, who will be joining us uh, pretty shortly for us uh, to have that conversation. Right, uh, we'll be going to Felix Ofo Squatchi pretty shortly so we can have that conversation. But let's move on to other stories while we try and raise uh, Felix of Osukwache to re react to Dr. Baumia's uh, uh, suggestion, the former president, to take a look at the data for speaking. Otherwise, he would embarrass himself. I'm told that Felix of Osukwache is on the line now and he's joining us. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Thank you. We're grateful that you could join us. Uh, good afternoon, man. Thanks for having me. Mm. So, I want a quick reaction from the John Mahama camp over the comments by uh, Vice President Dr. Mahamadou Baumia uh, advising former President John Dramani Mahama to take a look at the data before speaking. Otherwise, he'll embarrass himself. Well, I think that the Vice President is engaging in the simple, still, totally irrelevant politics of 2016. Uh, having become Vice President and head of the economic management team. He has been so badly forced as somebody who is full of talk but very little action. In fact, the COVID-19 outbreak, which has been here for a little over a month, has shown claim that the claims that we have been making about the economy are totally exaggerated and that we do not have the sort of economic buffers that he likes to come And in fact, every action that this government has taken in the wake of the COVID-19 outbreak on the economic front, it's a clear indication that the economy is in shambles. Now, I will go through this so that we clearly establish the point. When this COVID-19 struck, government simply did not have money to respond in terms of the sort of interventions that needed to be rolled out to ensure that people do not suffer. So government went to parliament to take leave to take up $200 million from the stabilization fund. And as the name would imply, that money is touched only when there is instability in the economy that it can be used to address problems that are right now. In addition to this, the government went to the IMF for $100 million to help it address the problem arising, arising out of COVID-19. Only last week or last two weeks, the government applied to the IMF for a rapid credit facility. Now, a rapid credit facility is actually normally given to low-income countries that have problems with their balance of payments. Now, balance of payments simply means that you have reserves to be able to provide port cover over a certain period. So, so, it so, simply so, so it, I know that uh, I've... Going out an amount of but, now, when you go for balance of payment support, it is that your reserves have a huge hole 
which need to plot. Now, all these things are telltale signs. Of right. So, so, Mr. Hosu I, I don't have a lot of time. I know that. Yes. I, I know that we would. We would would have a longer time uh, to talk about this, but I, I need to just get some clarity before we continue. So the point you've raised uh, from the very beginning suggests that uh, you are of the view that the, the government's claims, uh, you know, do not fly in the face of the data, considering that one, they had gone to seek relief from the World Bank. They've uh, made uh, overtures to access the stabilization fund. These, for you, uh, suggest that the economy is not in that much of a sound thing and the government should think again, right? Absolutely. And beyond that, all the international financial analysts are predicting that our economy will grow by 1.5%, which will be the worst in 40 years. They are also predicting that we are going to have a deficit exceeding 9%. They are predicting that our debt to GDP ratio will go to 70%, which will make us a highly indebted poor country. Also predicting that interest rates will rise and that exchange rates will continue to depreciate. Now, all of these are clear indications that the economy is in serious difficulty. So, instead of the vice president showing off and trying to put a brave face to a very terrible situation, he should be candid and admit that the claims we've been making about the economy have turned out to be false. And that when COVID 19 struck for three weeks to one month, we have been brought down to our knees. Now, President Mama has called for dialogue, the debate on what proposals can be tabled and ensure that Ghanaians do not suffer as a result of these effects. I would have thought that the Vice President would be brave enough to put something on the table so that we can consider it and have a debate around. Instead of seeking to take pot shot as the former President. So really, every Ghanaian right. president has the right to comment about what's happening, to carry out effective school on what government is doing, so that we are not led astray and we are not led into this right. record. Uh, as I speak to you, this government has failed to build a sort of economy that can offer the necessary that support for the people of this country. And the Vice President right. must admit, instead right. of it to guard people who want to make informed commentary about the current situation. Right, um, so for Sukwachi, we're grateful for it. And thank you extremely. Uh, Felix Ofo Sukwachi speaks for former President John. Dramani Maha. Let's move on to other stories. Some COVID-19 safety campaign billboards mounted at some areas within a crowd where photographs of President Kufuado without a face mask will be replaced by the advertisers who mounted them. Uh, this uh, follows concerns raised by government that the uh, imaging and messaging on the billboards are inappropriate. The advertisers were therefore directed to put down the billboards. A tweet from the information minister Sunday at Mayfield reads, we have asked city authorities to pull this down. We encourage the well-intentioned advertisers to engage with us directly to avoid such mishaps in the future. Unquote. The director has caused a stare on social media as many have questioned the rationale behind the government's directive. Uh, the advertisers Kaiser's Association of Anna has, however, confirmed the billboards will be replaced. So let's uh, quickly uh, get on to uh, Zoom right now and with Francis Dazzi, who is Executive uh, Director of the Advertisers Association of uh, Ghana. Good, good afternoon, sir, and thank you very much for your time. So I'm curious how uh, the Advertisers Association will go up Ahead with such an important infrastructure of a billboard with the president's image on it without doing the necessary consultations that will uh, ensure that the image is approved, the messaging is approved, and the location is approved also. Yeah. Razi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, sorry. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Yes. So, uh, the fact of the matter is that the Advertising Association of Ghana, through its membership, has donated 50 billboards to support the COVID campaign. Mm. Now, these billboards have messages that are general messages as put out by the Ghana Health Service mm. on the board. Now, the current situation that we have is that some other Individuals approach this company to mount this for outreach without going to the Ministry of Information. And that is an anomaly which must be corrected. And so that's what happened. 
So, 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 so Mr. Dazi, when you see some other individuals, I want to understand whether these individuals took steps or measures that were contrary to what the Advisors Association would have recommended. Of course, uh, yes, because with the Advertising Association of Ghana, whatever information we're going to put on, on those boards has to be rooted to the Ministry of Information. Mm -hmm. But these are individuals who, on their own volition, went to a particular uh, global company and asked them to man those uh, boards for them. So it is not part of what the Advertising Association of Ghana donated to, to the ministry. Because we will not do it. We will make sure that the ministry signs up before we put us on those boards. But mm -hmm. these are individuals who are to contract uh, a, a billboard company to that. Right. So, so right now, as we're told, we're informed that the billboards will be pulled down. Who bears the cost? Well, of course, uh, the, the billboards are not being pulled down. It is the flexing materials. The ad, which is the material, flexing material, which is going to be changed. And the company that mounted the boards will bear that cost. That is what it is. The company mm. that mounted it, ad, ad, ad law company, that mounted it will bear the cost. It's their loss. So I want to I want to find out from you, really, uh, since you're drawing a, a clear distinction between those individuals who uh, mount this billboard without the authorization of the Advertisers Association. I want to find out whether the billboards that the Advertisers Association mounted uh, had a photograph of the president wearing a face mask. The Advertisers Association has so far not mounted any board, board with a photograph of the president. Right. The boards we have mounted have just general messages of washing of hands, social distance, no shaking of hands, using hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. Those are the mm -hmm. general messages. Right. That was out there for the Ministry of Health when the COVID-19 uh, broke out. That is the information from the Information Ministry, which is out there. That is what we are replicating on the board. Right. Right, so, so tell me what kind of uh, discussions you've had with these uh, uh, individuals who mounted the photographs, the billboards well, and the photographs. Put, what are you... We have drawn the attention to it, and so they are removing the flexes of those materials. And going forward, we, we are going to, to we are making sure, that whether it's in somebody's private business or whether it is, that moves and comes to any of the members, we must still clear with the Ministry of Information. And that's what we are going to make sure that Going forward, that is done to the letter. So when anybody comes with any information once it has to do with the COVID-19 campaign in whatever shape or form, we must make sure that the communication has been cleared by the Ministry of Information before it's put out. And that's why we are very clear and we'll be strong on that. Mm, so, so are you able to confirm to us whether you've been giving, or I don't want to say the Advertiser Association, but, but those are the individuals who are working with you. Have they been giving... Uh, an approved photograph from the presidency. As of now, it's been worked on. No, as of now, it's been worked on because that was not the immediate decision to use photograph. It was the messages that should be out there. So once people have got to use the initiative of using photographs, of others that have been photoshopped on social media, just to make sure it's a communication. The key thing is that it's a communication. And so some other individuals in their own initiative to help and support the campaign and make sure it's spread about where your marks have decided to do some other Photoshop with the president on it. That is not official photograph. But why is the president and the marks and the communication is out there? I mean, let's support it and make sure that we get this out of our country because not a lot of advertising companies are in crisis. 50% of the companies are down. Workers at home and fix that. So we are interested in making sure that we support for this pandemic go away so that our lives can return to normal, so that our business can return to normal. That is the key thing. So that is why we are putting all this effort in there to support that the communication go out. Right. Uh, Mr. Dazi, uh, we're grateful for your time. Thank you very much uh, for Thank joining you. us. Uh, Francis Dazi, it's uh, with the Advertising Association of Ghana. This is still midday live from our studios at Ade Week. And uh, in Accra, let's move on to other stories. The latest Afro Barometer survey has revealed that 72% of uh, uh, Ghanaians feel the media is not very free or not at all free to report or comment on the news without government interference. According to the Afro Barometer survey, this is despite recording the largest increase in 
support for press freedom in Africa. Only two in 10, which constitutes about 19% think that the media is somewhat free or completely free to do so. The second lowest perception of media freedom among eight countries surveyed in 2019. The report's findings noted also that support for media freedom is widespread among all key demographic groups. In the report, 65% of Ghanaians say that they should have the right to publish any views and ideas without government restrictions. This marked a 29 percentage point increase after a sharp dip to 36 percent in the 2017 survey. Also, three in ten respondents say government should have the right to prevent publications it disapproves of. Right, so let's engage a research analyst at the Center for Democratic Development, Gilfred Isiama Boateng, who is joining us on Skype uh, this morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mr. Siama. How are you, sir? Good, good afternoon. I beg your pardon. Uh, how are you doing? Right, so uh, I want to hear what your initial thoughts are over the Afrobarometer findings, which uh, has both good and bad there. Well, I think uh, from the Afrobarometer findings, um, it is very clear um, that Ghanaians want more media freedom. Or they want the media um, to have more freedom to operate without any unnecessary interference um, or control uh, from the government or the state. Um, and again, I think the work of the media is widely acknowledged by Ghanaians um, who are indicated that the media um, should be free to investigate wrongdoings in the government, to expose corruption, and do their duties, which is required of them um, in this democratic space. And again, I think um, a lot of Ghanaians uh, also must be worried about um, the, the interference or the the the, the why the media um, can't operate freely, uh, which 72% of Ghanaians have indicated that they don't think the media is free to operate, even though they want the media to be free to operate, expose government corruptions and mistakes, and also be free to publish views and comments on what is going on in the country. Mm, but, but Mr. Siama, only two in ten actually uh, are of the view that the media is somewhat free, which actually supposes that we're not entirely free in, in the democratic space we live in. Well, well that, that is true. Um, that is true. And um, I think let's be mindful um, about the survey um, and the, the context within which the survey was conducted. Um, we organized this survey in the midst of um, attacks against the media and right from the beginning of 2019 and to allegations by some journalists who were working for Modern Anna um, who claimed that because they were trying to publish things that um, the government disapproved of, um, they had been beaten and, and more treated in the course. Um, we are talking about the time when a lot of media houses um, whom government believed they were not Line, um, with stated regulations um, had been shut. I mean, that is right, but you know, we haven't seen this um, critical stance by government for, for some time. So when you begin to see all these things happening um, in a space within a very short time, um, the shock that it gives to people and the signal it sends to people um, won't be correct or won't be right. So I think Ghanaians responded uh, based on what they were seeing um, in the political space. I know that one of the things that were confronted with with in the media space is social media, the proliferation of social media and the, the upsurge of fake news within the democratic space we're in. I mean, if you look at the fact that COVID-19 is here, there have been other uh, public health uh, emergencies we've been confronted with. But uh, moving forward in our expression of uh, free press, how would you recommend that we all guard against fake news and the excesses of social media. Well, I think I think we we need more education um, on how to detect fake news. Um, some countries have started where they are intensifying 
education on fake news. Uh, fake news may not necessarily happen within your space. It may be some people in other countries who are pushing those news um, into your space. So it may not necessarily uh, be the, the, the fault of journalists in the country. Um, I think it's, it is not something that calls for any government inter intervention. Uh, I think that that should be the last thing. And I I think that shouldn't even happen at all. And um, what we should do is to do more education. So what, so what you're saying is that people should be free, uh, irrespective, to publish anything they, they want. I mean, the, bar, the Afro Barometer Survey actually said that a uh, uh, majority of uh, respondents actually wanted the media to have the space to publish anything without government restriction. But we make progress that way. Well, I, I think the media uh, is expected to conduct itself more professionally and uh, more responsibly. We know the media space um, is occupied by professionals. The social media is a different space where we have citizens and people who do have any professional background um, who try to share news, And but the media is trained. They are professional. So people really believe in the media and their ability to do the right thing. Um, I think that, that it's not a complete picture that the media has been doing the correct or the right thing over the years, but people still believe that in the media, they should be free to do whatever they, they, they have to do. Um, it's their constitutional right, it's their democratic right, and it's also the rights of citizens who need the media to act, to share information, to detect wrongdoing, to also support them, for them to know more about the state and also make decisions as to which government they want to support and how to also hold government accountable. Right. Uh, Mr. Siyan, thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us. This is still midday uh, live from our studios at the Sawe Kanda in Accra. Right, uh, let's uh, do other stories. Now, the Biosafety Level 3 Laboratory at uh, the Western Region Veterinary Services Department will commence testing of COVID-19 samples today. The laboratory will start with the testing of 300 samples a day. Meanwhile, the Region has recorded four new cases in four different districts. Our Western uh, Regional Reporter, Ari J filed the following report. So behind me is the Biosafety Level 3 lab that is being prepared to commence testing of COVID-19 cases here in Western Region. The last time we came here, this inscription out of bounds was not there. We are learning that testing will commence today and we are going to begin with some 300 samples. This testing facility has a um, biosafety level 3 laboratory and biosafety level 2 laboratory, which is required uh, by WHO for testing. As we speak, we are ready to start testing today. Um, the, the staff have been trained already. Um, all the logistics have been provided by Noguchi. Um, Professor Ampofo has led this uh, activity to make sure this thing is working today. Um, talking about the, the number of samples we can test a day, Currently, we are going to test 300 samples a day. That is what we want to start with. And as time goes on, we will be increasing the number. Yes, of the facility here tell us that they have some challenges. And in response to call on people to come and support them, the Western Region House of Chiefs this morning presented a check for 40,000 Ghana cities to help them help the place to be able to adequately commence the work. We don't have a way to stop it right at the moment, but we can support people and also help reduce the victims that this uh, virus has come to claim. It is true, some people don't think this is necessary. I can guarantee you, if you listen to what is going on around the world, this is not a joke. So all the measures that have been brought up by the president and the medical team should be followed. I don't think any Nana chief want to wear mask, but it's necessary. So there are a lot of things that national cannot actually provide us. So with this kind of support from the national chief, uh, house of chiefs, we have been able to go a very, very long way to actually make the work here easy for us. Because they've got a very big backlog, and then they're going to take all this back and make sure that things are done. So it means they'll be working around the clock, 24 hours a day. So we need, we need all the help that we can actually marshal from everybody. And if they're starting with 300 a day, and then we, as you said, According to what you said, we have around 500. That means we will finish it within two days. So I, I don't foresee any uh, delay in what they are doing. Western Region Minister Kobina Oche Dago Mensa has confirmed to us that the region has four new cases from four different okay. districts. Um, we have a case at uh, 
uh, Agunam Kanta. We have one in Ekma. We have one in Empoho. And then one at uh, Elembele. Now we have it. So we have to find a way to manage it. One of the most luckiest things I've come to realize that most of the cases are imported cases. So it's our responsibility to make sure it doesn't spread in the community. It doesn't spread in the community. So please, um, I know that we'll talk about Takwa and the rest. When we confirm them properly, we'll get them communicated to you properly. But the most important thing is that the media spread the knowledge about the protocols that people need to use to prevent the disease from getting to them and to the homes. Right, so uh, let's do some other stories. Now, COVID-19 cases in Ashanti region have shot up to 100 with four deaths. Uh, we're quickly going to Skype right now. Our correspondent, William Evans Inkum, is joining us with uh, some details. So, Mr. Inkum, thanks very much uh, for, for, for your time. Uh, tell me, what happened? Well, uh, thank you very much for having me. So, currently, the Ashanti region has recorded 124 cases of COVID-19. Now, let me just give you the breakdown. So, after 124, we have 96 of the cases who are currently receiving home care, based, I mean, home-based care. Then we have four deaths. Four people have died. We have three people on admission at the moment and 21 recoveries. So, that is the current situation in the Ashanti region, Stephen. Mm -hmm. So, I want to hear from you what the authorities are saying about these numbers, especially because because this appear to be a spike. Well, so, well, so I mean, most of them are not surprised because looking at the fact that social distancing is still a problem in most uh, marketplaces. And again, they've also been telling us that these are not new cases that one will say um, being generated from anywhere. It just, and uh, the number of, I mean, a high chapter that are producing um, these cases. But they are so worried. Uh, I mean, like I said earlier, the fact that people are not sticking to the social distancing protocol. For example, if you go to the commercial market, I mean, the um, uh, clearly has led a number of measures just to ensure that people adhere to the safety protocol. But, uh, All right, I'm saying you're going to do, I mean, the same thing. It's not too different from a uh, thing that's a mess at the market. So they are having a difficult time uh, making people understand uh, the, the reality on the ground and the fact that they need to be more cautious about their health. Right, Ms. Ankum, so I, I can see your background that you're standing at, uh, in front of Golding Tulip Hotel, which appears to be totally deserted. Is this a reflection of uh, the hotel situation? in Kumasi as a result of COVID-19? You're right. Um, I'm talking to you now. I hear that over 100 casual workers have been laid off. And we are still trying to dig deep to get a confirmation of that. But I mean, apart from the fact that uh, the, uh, some casual workers have, have been given the, I mean, have been given the, have been put out as far as the current situation is concerned. I mean, there are other businesses that also operate within the Golden Tulip Club. We are talking about car hiring and all of that. I mean, taxis and all of that. All these groups of uh, businesses have been affected hugely as far as the uh, COVID-19 is concerned. But it's not only the Golden Tulip that is in this uh, a bad side of the situation we find ourselves in. If we go to other, I mean, uh, hospitality, I mean, hotels and all of you, also facing similar problem there, Right, thank you very much for that swift update. Uh, William Anzinkum is our reporter from the Ashan region, bringing us up to speed with the situation with COVID-19 cases and number of recoveries and number of deaths in the Ashanti region. He also touched base with the situation with hotels and the fact that many of them have had to lay off staff uh, in the region. Let's move to other stories. Civil and low government staff association clocks have, have expressed fear that more workers could lose their lives to inadequate pension contributions to mark this year's May Day celebration. The association that members who retired recently after 20 years in service are receiving 
as uh, low as 160 Ghana cities as lump sum from Senate. Uh, we'll bring back an interview with clock uh, uh, boss Isaac Bampado. Sam. It will interest you know, I have one person, Ajimano, said he was given 160 Ghana cities by Snit. That's what we're talking about. 160 Ghana. This is past credit, lump sum, by Snit. For 30 years, it gave him 160 Ghana cities. Not 160,000, no, 160 Ghana. So that's what we're talking about. This is more deadly than coronavirus. You give someone 160 Ghana as his lump sum, and you say we shouldn't talk about it. We should stop talking about coronavirus. If you contribute for 20 years, and still gives you 160, it's it, 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 We've taken time, and that's why we, are, we want everybody to know that the situation we find ourselves in is more dangerous than coronavirus. All right, so that's the executive secretary, the general secretary, I beg your pardon, of Clocks Isaac Bampo there. But I must tell you that uh, just a while ago, SNIT, the Social Security and National Insurance Trust, has issued a statement on uh, on this story. And I need to, to go uh, read through all, all that uh, before we get onto the telephone lines again. Reaction from Isaac Bambo, the executive secretary of Clocksack. So uh, let me quickly read through. The, the, the letter says that the management of the Social Security and National Insurance Trust, SNIT, wishes to respond to your inquiry regarding the assertion by Clocksack that some SNIT contributors are receiving 160 cities as lump sum after working for 30 years. We wish to state that, one, the last group of SNIT contributors to receive the 25% lump sum payment from SNIT under the PNDC law 247 turned 60 years on 31st December 2019. Effective January 2020, that's the second point, Sentier scheme operators took over the payment of lump sum to pensioners in accordance with the National Pensions Act of 766. SNIT, therefore, no longer pays the 25% lump sum benefit to contributors who retire effective January 2020. SNIT only pays monthly pension and past credit to pensioners who qualify. The past credit is 4% of a contributor's annual salary up to December 2009. Workers covered by the three-year pension, that's Act 766 with SNIT contributions, prior to January 2010, are entitled to past credit up to uh, December 2009. Interest on the past credit is calculated for every contributor up to the point of retirement. The total past credit, which is 4% of annual salary plus accrued interest, is then paid to members at the point of retirement. The amount one receives as past credit solely depends on the salaries on which contributions paid prior to 2010 of January and Treasury bill interest rates. Five, currently no SNIT pensioner earns less than 300 Cs as monthly pension. In the situation where a pensioner's computed monthly benefit is below 300, it is adjusted to the minimum pension of 300. Management remains firmly committed to paying over 213 million cities in pensions to the 213,172 pensioners on the SNIT payroll, as well as honoring payments to all new pensioners that apply. So this is a uh, five point, is a seven point uh, uh, response to our story. And this is, uh, I've read all all of it. I have six points of it. But let's quickly get 
to the telephone lines and reaction from Isaac Bampuado, Executive Secretary of Clocksax. Mr. Bampuado, uh, so you told us a while ago uh, that the uh, SNCC was paying, well, I mean, some of your workers were receiving 160 gas cities as lump sum, but SNCC says no, nobody gets 160 as lump sum. They're not responsible for paying that. It's their uh, tier two uh, contributors, effective January 2020, that are supposed to pay that. And the minimum everyone is getting every month is 300. So these are the facts. What do you say to them? Well, you know, SNIT not put that into our eyes. You know, the uh, pension act is there for all of us to read, and they are aware that they the act. What is made of long term is past credit. Past credit are with SNIT. Mm. And then they themselves are aware that they don't transfer this past credit to the skips. They are still in this past credit, and that's what they are saying at long term. I will not want to argue them on this. We will we'll send copies of payment, payment advices that they themselves have set up. For us to know what, what they are paying. They we don't need to argue about this. So, this so Mr. Bampado, we'll if, I, under if I understand you... That if they have been out to retire. So, Mr. Bampo, if I understand you uh, correctly, you're saying that uh, SNIT's explanation is not exactly accurate. No, no, it's breaking, it's breaking. Okay, so I'll try it and see if you can hear me. I'm, I'm asking you whether you are suggesting to us and uh, our viewers that SNIT's explanation is not exactly accurate and that they're still paying uh, past credit, which Come. is... is Come again. All right, so, Mr. Bampo, uh, can you hear me? I think that we're again, so, right so i try and uh, ask my question again if you can hear me i'll be slow a little bit so uh, can you hear me right uh, this is still midday live from our studios at adesawe kandai the crowd mr bampuado is able to hear me but it has reacted to uh, allegations that it paid it, it pays 160 ghana cities as lump sum to pensioners some of who have worked about 30 years and that's the long uh, uh, response that I read for you. We'll be bringing you details of that response in our subsequent bulletins. This is still Midday Live. I'm Stephen T. And we'll be right back with more news. Please stay. Welcome to the business segment on Midday Live. This is a result uh, 48 hours after shutdown of the systems uh, creating a huge backlog uh, the port. More than 3,000 declarations were processed in less than two hours after the system was restored, with importers paying 45 million CDs as revenue to the state. Joining entry, AJ has been following up on this issue and joining us on the telephone uh, now. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am, and thank you. We're grateful for your time. So, what can you report? Hello, Josephine. Hello, Steve. Good yes, afternoon. You, good afternoon. So, what can you report? Right, Stephen. So, uh, currently at the court, uh, as rightly informed our viewers, well, after the restoration of the system, the GCNet West Blue system, for the first quarter, there has been a huge backlog uh, here, which has compelled the importers to rush in to put their declarations and put their process in place. And where you really find a huge build of uh, people here are the banks. Currently, we have only two banks that is receiving duties for government. And then the two places have been inundated with people because of uh, COVID-19 social distance protocol. Most of them have been put outside the banking, uh, in front of the bank. So they, you find them grouped. Uh, one, a few of that day, but you have a huge number of people. I can say that we have about, when I went to Echo Bank, you can find about 800 people there who are waiting to so pay in the duty so that they can continue with the process. Another area which you also find a lot of people who are trooped there is the revenue center and the shipping lines. That's where those who have done their fresh declaration, their process, are going to take in the CCV out so that they can continue with the process. And also, earlier, we visited the terminals.
that's the last part of the process. Those who have already paid their duties and also um, can't do and waiting to be cleared out. That's where you find most of the tracks that are lined up. As of three days ago, we had about 2,000 trucks which were ready to be exited. But because we had system, we had problems with the system. GCNS system is connected to the NTS system, which gives clearance for these trucks to drive up freely. So as of today, because they were introducing a few of the manual process units, other things have been restored. It's going at a very slow pace, very, very slow pace. And that's a sort of worry to most of the street forwarders. But but, but, but Josephine, uh, quickly, yes. before you go, is it expected to pick up? Because I know that all of these unipass is actually meant to speed up things, not to slow down things. So uh, maybe I reckon that the, the backlog has resulted in slow pace. Uh, are the importers expecting that the following days coming, things will be much faster? Stevie, yes. That's the hope that we are all believing um, in that. In the coming uh, few days uh, to come, I'm sure because of the system just picked up, things will be a bit slower. Right. But uh, in, in, in the next few days, we've seen an improvement for people to get to clear, pay their duty so that they can step up. But when right. I engaged the freight forward, the area that a particular issue that they raised to me was that, well, after the meeting, they were told that the system has restored. Voila, work is going on. This is has Right, but right. also, they couldn't tell them that whether it's going to be GC system is going to be on for three Ruta, months. Josephine, thank you very months. much. Uh, Josephine Ajay uh -huh. is our correspondent uh, reporting uh, to us on the progress of the Unipass at the Tema Ports. This is still Midday Live. Uh, we'll be right back with sports. Hi, good afternoon. It's time to do sports now here on Midday Live on TV3. My name is Yao Ofosula. Now, Isaac Dogbe has been in the news over the past few weeks. Now, for claims his father made in an interview that uh, he says were misconstrued. Now let's uh, take you back. Now a week ago, Dobby's father, Paul, granted an interview to a local radio station that intimated that they opted to train in their hometown because they wanted to be away from the hustle and bustle of Accra. Now, news was that they had visited a fetish priest just before the Navarrete bout, but Dobby in this short clip has debunked those claims. I want to make this very, very clear. I, as a baby, I have no association with any fetish priest. I have never consulted any fetish priest to help me win any fight. I have always accredited my trees to God and to God alone. So it doesn't make sense that I will go to a first priest and consult him to help me win a fight. God has been with me from the very first beginning through all my victories and through my defeat. I believe in prayer and I pray to God for victory. But and in in addition, I also ask holy servants of God to also pray on my behalf in the lead up to fight and these rumors that are going around as ridiculous as they are they have caused a lot of embarrassment to my family to myself to my friends and all those that I am associated with I just want to say that I have no desire to worship a deity. I believe in a one and only true God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Well, that's Isaac Dobie there speaking uh, about his father's claims uh, in that one. Let's move on. And uh, the coronavirus pandemic is affecting football clubs, and they have one mission, and that's to ensure that the players will stay in good physical condition and be ready for uh, whenever time the game resumes. But it's a difficult task, and at home, footballers could do otherwise.
Spice. We spoke to Buffers Operations Manager, that's Giorgio Fushihine, who explains how they carried out this task at the academy. The technical team, uh, uh, they are in contact with all the players and they have a, a common platform that uh, while they are home, they assign individual trainings for them to do it while they are home so that it will keep them uh, in shape before they start. You don't know when, but you should be always ready when, you know, I think, and then I'm very sure that in even when if league going to start again or resume again, you make uh, it will be maybe two weeks to one month that will announce to us for us to prepare. But before then, I think individually they assign individual players what they need to do. They, they are doing while they are home, and some of them even as even uh, they can send their videos back to their te technical team. So I think we are in uh, still monitoring what they are doing while they are home. Well, that's all the sports news this afternoon here on Midday Life. Now, Kuma Wood, actor and preacher and Bishop Bernard Nyako, I'm sure you, you know by now, has died. Reports indicate the popular actor who gave up the ghost on Saturday night battled an unknown illness for months. Uh, Joseph Ouswarai reports that his colleague actors have been paying tribute to the late actor. Ghanaians were thrown into a state of shock, disbelief and mourning following the death of seasoned actor Bishop Bernard Nyakon. In 2019, the actor was struck by an unknown ailment which took him off the screens. He later had an operation to correct the condition. The news of the versatile actor's demise went viral on Saturday evening, May 2, 2020. Many movie enthusiasts and celebrities, including his colleague Kuma Wood actors, have been mourning their friend and brother. Renowned actress Mercy Esiedu couldn't control her tears when the news reached her. <laughs> Yao Dabo was equally shocked and wept uncontrollably after hearing the news. Through a Facebook post, popular actor Kojo Nkansan Win mourned his colleague with a message that read, Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Ow, Bishop Bernard Nyakon, father of all, we are in a queue of death. God forgive us all. May the Lord keep your soul in a perfect place. R.I.P. Bishop Akta Kweku Minu wrote. Vivian Jill wrote, My heart is broken. Rest in peace, Bernard. Reacting to the news, actress Nanama Mac Brown said they had made several efforts to visit their colleague at the hospital, but all proved futile as the actor made several excuses as to why they should wait for the right time. The top actor battled a short illness in 2019 but recovered in early 2020. May he so rest in peace uh, and uh, condolences to his family and all, all fan base of uh, Bernard Yanko. I'm Stephen Enti. And that's how we wrap with Midday Live. The, on behalf of the crew, good afternoon. There is more news at 3news.com.